Welcome everyone to NAWA's report to the community. We're so pleased you've taken the time to be here. My name is Jessica Ryan and I'm communications manager for NAWA. You'll also be hearing from Rajan Rathnavalu, president, uh, Sebastian Ryu, operations manager, and Gage Tweedy, uh, energy auditor. We plan to take about uh, 45 minutes for our presentation and leave some time for questions afterward. But uh, by all means, feel free to ask questions during the presentation, either verbally or through the chat function. Uh, we ask that uh, until you have questions or comments, um, perhaps put your microphone on mute. Um, also, if you're having trouble seeing the presentation in the full screen, you may want to try uh, in your upper right hand corner on your screen, there might be some options for different view um, versions. And again, thank you for coming and take it away, Raj. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Jessica. Uh, and thank you to everyone for joining. It's quite a pleasure to be with you this evening. It's uh, a very uh, unusual time across the world. And um, I guess as we begin, I was just le listening to the news reports about uh, the many doctors, frontline healthcare workers, all the many support staff who are busy taking care of so many people so uh, we can have some semblance of normalcy perhaps in our lives. And, and uh, so with those people in mind and, and many others that we begin tonight. And much gratitude for you all uh, for joining us. As, as you'll probably discover throughout the evening, we're, um, I'm not sure what the word is, a deeply intentional organization. And so a lot of the words and I think the kind of vision of what we're striving towards may be uh, a collective conversation that we're all uncertain about uh, in much the way COVID has changed our sense of what we, the world we live in, uh, in many ways, environmental concerns and climate change uh, also are changing how we understand our relatedness to each other. So in that spirit, our organization is born from a wish to step into uh, the world that we're hoping to live in. And part of us having the honor to share this evening with you is for us to get a chance to tell our story and by speaking our story into our society, hopefully we can uh, create a trajectory for a better collective embrace of the world that we live in. So just a couple of points about NAWO. Uh, we're a social enterprise, a nonprofit social enterprise started in 2016, uh, principally uh, inspired by a program called Spirit of the Land uh, that was um, embedded in the Augustana campus, the U of A campus here in Camrose. And as such, uh, I think many of us were inspired by notions of reconciliation. How do we create a, weave ourselves into the world in a more connected way? Uh, I think for me personally, it was how do I take the inner, I think the because the inner feelings I have about my care for the world and enact them in my life. So part of the dialogue for a company is this relationship between our innermost values and innermost sense of what it means to be human and how we live that out in the world. And with this as a founding principle, uh, in speaking with Elder Roy, uh, who gave our company name Nawo, which we'll describe a bit, um, the value of Wakotuin, which is we are all kin. And this fabric of our interwovenness guides our responsibility to each other and our actions in the world. And how can we take those kinship ties and really make that the foundations for our life together? Uh, and as such, I think in the next economy, the one that's emerging, we won't see community ecology and ecology um, these, this battle between the environment or business, but really see it as one fabric of a whole where the health of one part is the health of the other. Mm 
Yeah, so it's uh, Sebastian speaking now. Um, as Jessica said, I'm kind of the operations manager and business guy at Nuo. <clears throat> and uh, social enterprise might be kind of a new term to some of you. Um, some of you know it very well. Uh, but this is kind of a good continuum to explain kind of where it fits in between a, a charity and a strictly profit-seeking uh, organization. And as you can see, uh, market tools and nonprofit kind of motives overlap over top of social enterprise. And what that means is a social enterprise kind of has the same mandate and mission and operates very similarly to a nonprofit, but is it has the ability to be more entrepreneurial and use market tools to essentially create its own uh, lines of revenue. And the advantage of that is instead of relying on grant funds and kind of always being relying on government and foundations to kind of make things happen, it can then begin to use business practices to make good and uh, yeah, good things happen in their community. And it's kind of a new and emergent um, business model. That's very exciting. So as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Elder Roy and Judy Lewis have been quite foundational and inspirational for our formation. Uh, if anything, you can go away having learned a bit more Cree. Uh, so Newo is the Cree word for four. And <clears throat> as I was explaining the vision for the company, Elder Roy took out uh, the literal and proverbial uh, kitchen table napkin and started drawing out the four elements that you see there, Mother Earth, uh, the green circle embracing the four different nations or races, uh, the element of fire, uh, the red circle, water, wind. So these four elements have, uh, in many cultures, uh, a both an inner and an outer aspect and it's this intimate connection between who we are as human beings and the health and integrity of the ecosystems around us that is a principal guide. And for the Plains Cree of our Treaty 6 region, uh, Newo is a foundational, uh, a very sacred and foundational number, uh, representing the four seasons, the four directions, the four aspects of being human, uh, the Nahiao or the people of four, um, so this holistic vision in just the four human aspects that we are mind, body, spirit, and emotion, and these four elements should be respected in all our activities, whether it be business or education. And you can just see how such a lens uh, transforms even an educational classroom when, you know, we show up, we are embodied human beings uh, who have this emotional sensitivity to the world and you know, that, that tenderness of a kindergarten kid that asks, you know, why are there people who are hungry? You know, that's a guiding light for how our education and life in the world should unfold. So both as a corporation, uh, we try to take these, this holistic vision uh, very seriously in terms of our business practices, um, how we treat each other as members of our uh, human community and externally with respect to the, the people we relate to, but also internally in terms of how we interact with ourselves within the organization. So uh, this is a bit uh, a meander through the past year and some of the activities we've done. Um, and, and also a little bit of telling the story of how Wakotuan finds its life within our organization so the next slide shows the, the weaving together. I, I'd say, as I was thinking about a theme for the evening, I was reminded of a, a quote from William Shakespeare, where he says uh, in a lesser known play, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. And we started out perhaps somewhat arbitrarily installing solar PV, but that one touch of the world uh, quickly had us embedded, uh, embedding solar training in our interactions with the communities um, because it makes no sense to go into a community without empowering the local people to participate and be uh, empowered to engage this emerging industry. And then 
as you'll see, we soon began developing energy audits. And I think the story of Freedom Church that others will explain later will show how really a solar, a solar installation is one piece of a larger puzzle asking how it is we interact energetically in our homes and businesses with the world around us. So energy audits was a natural next step. And of course, uh, out of gratitude, really, you realize that without these communities uh, choosing to support your business, really, you have no business. So this sense of giving back, I think, is a natural next step for any organization oriented uh, to think it, about community. And then a more recent um, addition to our consideration of our work in the world has been adding some innovative financial tools. And I see Sean Loney is with us this evening. So we've been working with Encompass Co-op, uh, a national social enterprise organization to really do some quite inspiring and pioneering work uh, in basically using, as Seb mentioned, the tools of the marketplace to really leverage good outcomes. And as Sean always says, solutions are way cheaper than problems. Uh, and we're, we're experimenting and innovating to find the, the tools that can really take us into the next, the next earth care economy. And then the final weaving of the picture uh, in some of our offshoot projects, we've really been interested in access to land for next generation and indigenous farmers in particular. Um, and so we're, the last project we'll leave you with this evening is a food curriculum, a very inspiring, I think, global leading program in Muskwachese, uh, a partnership with a fantastic food program uh, in the Muskwachese School District, uh, which we'll speak up about towards the end. Yeah, thanks for the intro, Raj. So I'll take you guys kind of through some of the solar projects we've done in the past year. And uh, yeah, kind of explain some of the partnerships we've developed and relationships we've made along the way. Um, so yeah, thus far, our primary um, I guess ways we've done solar are residential, uh, agriculture, and commercial. Um, we're also beginning to potentially explore entering uh, larger kind of solar installations, but that's more for the, the future for us. Uh, this year, we were able to install nine solar PV uh, installations. Uh, five of which were commercial. Um, and it was actually our first year doing commercial uh, installations. So doing five in one year was pretty impressive for our small organization. Uh, we were able to do three residential and then a, a small off-grid system. Um, and I'll detail some of these systems a little further um, as we go along. Uh, so yeah, here's a couple of images of some residential systems we did in Camrose and uh, Edmonton as well. And then in the next slide, there's our commercial systems, uh, two of which were in downtown Edmonton, and then the one on the far right is Freedom Church, just uh, south of Camrose. Uh, and then this is our commercial and off-grid installations that we did on Alexis First Nation, uh, just northwest of Edmonton, um, which I'll talk about these a little bit more in the near future here. Um, so like Raj mentioned, um, I guess part of our mandate as a social enterprise is to give back on our projects and to try and bring the greatest benefit from each dollar that we're paid. And so one way we do that um, is through training individuals with barriers to employment, typically within the communities or within the organizations that we work with. Um, yeah, so it's kind of giving them a leg up into this new green economy. Uh, go to the next slide. So we were able to do four training courses this year. Uh, including able, we were able to train 24 trainees, uh, seven of which were hired on projects and one was considered industry ready. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but most of the industry will only hire uh, essentially people that are electricians or journeymen's. Um, so it's, it's not an easy industry to get into. And that's one of the, I guess, things that we're finding out. But uh, with more experience and more projects, I think we'll be able to start getting these numbers a lot higher in the upcoming years. And that's part of the uh, financial projects that we're working on as well. Yeah, do you want to talk about this one, Raj? Yeah, sure. Um, we're 
pretty pleased. Uh, as I mentioned, we're really grateful for the partnerships we've established and really Yellowhead Tribal Development Foundation was our initial leg into the training industry. So we did our first training in 2018, a uh, 10 day program for indigenous youth. Uh, some of whom, uh, one of whom actually uh, is the one person that uh, Seb described as industry ready. Uh, so that was our first foray uh, and sort of, we were the only person that resp responded to their RFP. So I guess they were stuck with us and you know, being so young then we were wondered why we were chosen, but as things unfolded in the way the partnership went, it basically we became family uh, with many of the people involved. And so it, yeah, it was just a perfect fit for an organization like ours. And then last year in 2019, we were able to offer a four month uh, more professional level training. And then uh, the Bissell Center was, has been an ongoing partnership. Uh, we completed uh, a solar PV array on top of the Bissell Center. We're pretty proud of this one. We did a, a, a number of training programs with Bissell Center clients and then hired them to join us in, in completing this project. Uh, the, the neat thing about this particular project is uh, that part of the system is a live working system, but can be disassembled and reassembled for future training purposes. So we hope uh, through a great ongoing partnership with Bissell and this and other projects that that will remain a source of education for the solar PV industry in Alberta. And here once again uh, is Lexus, Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation again, uh, feels like becoming like family, if not already. Uh, this is the completion of a, a joint project with Spruce Permaculture, uh, where we uh, completed a off-grid system that's powering a fountain in this middle of in the middle of a permaculture garden at the busy four-way stop in downtown Alexis. Um, so it's quite an inspiring uh, synergy of all sorts of things, permaculture, garden. The, the garden is, was made in memory of the many ancestors who have passed away. So it has lots of significance on many, many levels. You can see Chief Tony in the middle, uh, and then Kaz, who is also working on the Muskwichis project in the green shirt on the right. Sorry guys, I was on mute. Uh, yeah, this is an image from one of our installations out at the First Nation. And you can see it's probably our favorite view of any installation we've ever done overlooking uh, Lac St. Anne. And this is their main administrative and uh, health building. And uh, the person you see there is Joby, who is a member of the community. And uh, funny enough, I actually played hockey with Joby growing up and he ended up uh, somehow going through one of our training programs and working with us. So that was kind of a, a, a cool story for me. And then, yeah, this is one of our, one of my favorite projects of the year, um, probably because it was kind of what I was in charge of, but this is the iHuman Youth Society in Edmonton. And they work primarily with at-risk indigenous youth. And um, they work essentially doing uh, mainly like art and creative projects. So you walk into their building and it's just covered with graffiti and all sorts of art. Um, it's really a vibrant place. They have music studios and uh, TV studios and all, all sorts of places where these kids can come and, and be creative and have a bit of a different outlet than they typically have. And so we were able to install solar on the iHuman building itself and do a training course with their youth and hire um, two of their youth to help with the installation. And uh, you see them sitting there on that deck. That's actually on the Bissell Center roof. Um, so we were able to take the iHuman uh, students and get them out onto the Bissell Center and use the live training array. So we're already kind of starting to weave some of our projects together within Edmonton and uh, increase our impact uh, through those connections. Uh, yeah, I'll just maybe transition this before we go. Um, so like Raj mentioned at the beginning, um, solar is one solution, but at the end of the day, there's probably 
in your building some bigger things you should attend to first. And this is where Gage really fits in with his energy auditing. So you can go ahead, Gage. Yeah, so for example, one of the projects that Seb had mentioned earlier was the solar array at Freedom Church. So they initially just hired us to put solar on the church. But when we went to the church and looked at it, we realized they needed something more. So we made sure that like the HVAC system that they currently had was just a coal furnace from probably the 50s. So we realized that would need to be changed out as well. So instead of just installing solar, we decided to look around, kind of do an energy audit and figure out what they actually need as well. And that's one thing we did for them. And for those who don't know, an energy audit is basically an investigation in to, into the energy flows of, of a building. So the electricity, natural gas, propane, if they have propane, and water. And we do this by looking everywhere in the house. We look for cracks where there might be air leakage. We look at the insulation to see if they need more to better insulate the building so, so you don't have to use as much heat. Or windows, installing new thermostats to to better use your furnace or installing better, more efficient faucet aerators or more efficient lighting or anything like that. And this does a lot for you. So A, this stimulates the economy by making a lot more jobs from energy audits to installation, uh, retrofit or installers, plumbers, HVAC installers, anything. So stimulates the economy and keeps money in our pocket by reducing your energy bills. It makes your building more comfortable, comfortable by making sure you don't have all these drafts throughout the house. And overall, it's just healthier for you. So lowering the heat bills, like I said earlier, increasing the air quality, reducing mold, left, less drafty, warmer and drier, and it just is better for, for you. And so in the past year, since we started energy audits, it's only been about a year, we've done 57 of them. And they're categories categorized in three different ways. So there's the ASHRAE level two audits, which is an American standard, which Canada also uses. And it's uh, more so just for commercial buildings. So we've done 15 of those. Then there's Enercan, which is a Canadian standard, which is more so for residential buildings. And then there's our own audits, which are basically investigations into the house to try to find any problematic areas and try to figure out how to fix those problems. And we've done these audits all around Alberta. So as far north as Grand Prairie, as far south as uh, well, as far north as Grand Prairie and as far east as uh, Lloyd Minster. And a lot of them were in Alexis First Nation. They had us do 51 different energy audits for them. And we were able to actually hire a few people from the community to help us with them. So the main one who was helping me the entire time is Kelton. You can see him at the bottom in the bottom picture. And he was with me for almost every single audit and helping me with, with the reports as well. Um, and with those audits, we also have a lot more coming up. Uh, one of the major products we have right now is at the Vistle Center once again. So we'll be doing four different audits for them on four different buildings. And we'll be trying to help them with installing whatever retrofits and installations that they will need to have. And we've, we're also working with Faithful Footprints. So they have a grant for United, by the United Church of Canada to have energy audits done and to have energy efficiency upgrades and retrofits for any church that needs them in Canada. And they have hired new us to be the ambassador for Alberta for the next three years. 
So that's going to be a lot of audits for them and a lot of us helping them with installing whatever retrofits and upgrades they need. And since they have grants, there are also a few other grants in Alberta. So there's the Edmonton Energy Audit Rebate, which is for 50% of the cost for an, energy, an ASHRAE energy audit for commercial buildings. There's the Edmonton Building Retrofit Accelerator, which is for almost any energy efficiency upgrade for any commercial buildings over 10,000 square feet. And then there's the Energy Reduction Alberta Energy Savings for Business, which is for all of Alberta. And it's for the most retrofits and also solar installations for small businesses, both small to medium businesses in Alberta. And since I'm talking about energy efficiency right now, we also have done a lot of talks and workshops about energy efficiency and solar. So last summer, the Métis Nation of Alberta hired us to go to 18 different communities and do workshops and presentations and talks about energy efficiency for them. So this is as far north as Fort Vermilion and as far south as uh, Lethbridge. And it was basically every single smaller town in Alberta. And we were also planning this year to do so, uh, solar PV talks. So we did one in New Norway and we were gonna do four others, but unfortunately that is right when COVID hit, so we couldn't finish them, but we're always happy and excited to do more solar PV talks and just educate more people about the industry. I should uh, uh, mention that as we expand outwards, uh, it also requires a great deal of internal transformation. So my degree is in religion and philosophy. And previous to that, I had worked a total of, after sort of tree planting in university, zero years in the business sector or in any regular economy. Um, so, and I had read somewhere that there comes a certain point where the founder becomes an obstacle to a company's growth. And in this case, uh, it was day one. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I'm very pleased to report that I've been totally replaced in many, most, if not all of my functions. Uh, firstly, you should mention Simon, who's on, uh, Simon Irving, he's uh now our our board chair thank you for relieving me of those duties simon simon's been a long-term board member and uh yeah we were students together in the spirit of the land program the first year that that was offered before it was even named that so simon's really been around uh from the beginning and and i think carries so well our deeper vision and ethos for what we're trying to do as 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 an organization and then Speaking of Spirit of the Land, Sebastian was a, a student in that during his time at Augustana. He was such a poor student, he took the program twice. And uh, <clears throat> and then in his third year, interned with us as a, as a business student. And then uh, finally, uh, well, he worked for us in the summer and then finally came on full time when he graduated. Uh, so Simon, or Sebastian wrote an email to me earlier this year outlining all the ways that uh, he had a vision to improve things. And so basically he was handed over the keys to the daily operations um, and has done a, a very fine job. So grateful for Seb's role with us. And then Colin Smith, who couldn't be here this evening, uh, founder and um, basically ran Green Event Services and sold his business last year has joined us on again, helping helping to take us to sort of these next stages in our company's growth. And Colin's been working most recently on an exciting potential solar farm project um, that's just uh, under development as we speak. So really appreciative to <clears throat> those individuals. And I guess our next rock star uh, to join our team is Jessica, who you met at the very beginning. Uh, Jessica is the former editor of the Cameras Canadian, 
who I must note that a couple of years after she left the Cameras Canadian, Alberta's longest standing newspaper is now no more. So that's just a small testimony to her skills and talents. Um, so she's really taken us to a next level in terms of her communications and uh, public relations. So she'll sp speak a bit about uh, some of the things that we're doing in that regard. Well, thank you, Raj. I feel like I should say my leaving the Canadian had nothing to do with its demise. Okay, so uh, I think many people on the call here uh, will, will know that they will have started a newsletter this summer because many of you are subscribers. Uh, started in June and there are currently 95 subscribers and it aims to bring uplifting stories to your inboxes and the response has been quite positive so far. Uh, so the stories have ranged from um, an interview with social enterprise expert Sean Loney, who's on the call today, uh, as well as a feature on solar adopter and chief NAO supporter Margaret Rathavalu, also here, and uh, as well as coverage of some of the anti-racism activities that took place in Camrose in the summer. In, in, and also other topics such as Augustana and different community stories uh, that would be of interest to people in the area. And as a natural extension of the newsletter, uh, Ne was planning to uh, produce a small quarterly print publication um, called the ASCII Journal. And as you see, ASCII is a Cree word roughly translated as land. So um, this, this journal will hopefully feature uh, articles on different themes, such as uh, the grouse, which is an interesting uh, native species that I've been learning about. So hopefully we'll bring you that uh, in, I expect the first edition in January. And I think some of you have noticed already that there's been some recent changes to our branding. Um, an investment readiness program grant um, has, has allowed NAWO to work with a local agency called Second Revolutions Communications uh, to update our website and logo. And so they recommended that the existing logo needed a bit of, of redesign to enhance kind of the, the weight and the vibrancy of the colors to help it stand out in the brand landscape. So we've just completed the design process and it includes a few different variations, including two that have Cree syllabics and pronunciation of our name. So we're very pleased with the result and looking forward to seeing the website finished uh, redesign in um, possibly the spring. So thank you very much and I'll turn it back to you, Rosh. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. Uh, I think the ASCII journal is another reflection of how we really take as our foundation uh, this wanting to give back to the community. Um, and I think the next the next economy will be characterized by the sense of abundance. Um, <clears throat> having been, I was born in in another country and coming to Canada, I think you see it with different eyes and in many ways, materially, Canadians have made it. And um, yeah, so many of the, the worries of, of many parts of the world just aren't present here for not all Canadians, for sure, and uh, but for many of us. And the sense of gratitude and abundance, I think, uh, is the foundation for our, our, our willingness and wish to have giving as the foundation for our work in the world. So we've always seen that in this spirit uh, that our, we want to support and, and foster good work wherever it might be. Uh, and towards these aims last year, we established Sunrise Farm Cooperative um, to really, as a means to try to address this uh, huge, probably the greatest land transfer since treaty. Um, and with farm prices being what they are, it's quite prohibitive for next generation farmers to enter uh, land as you know my settler grandpa did uh, coming from Scotland. So Sunrise Farm Cooperative is, is another vehicle and really it was that work I think that um, is, was one of the ways we connected to Muscochese, um, their food program. 
And then uh, I've mentioned the Spirit of the Land program. Oh, the Lieutenant Governor Bart's awards uh, is really a proud moment. Uh, the first time it was the the Arts Awards in Alberta were hosted in a First Nations community in Muskwachese. So we were just honored and thrilled to join uh, Roy and Judy Lewis at Musqueam Associates in all of Alberta. Just a, a great a great team, and we were. Uh, I would say in many ways, the junior partner just along for the amazing ride uh, and a very proud moment, a fantastic, I would say the best in history, but I probably have only been to one or two of these events, but um, just a great, a great, I think example of what happens when the best of indigenous and settler and newcomer communities uh, come together and share their gifts. And then the Spirit of the Land Foundation was established last year has just applied for charity status as, as a more, uh, I guess, um, institutionally charitable organization and as a part of our mandate to educate uh, this connection between spirit, community, and ecology. I'm, I'm uh, wondering if Seb, uh, you and Sean could take team on this next session because we have the Canada's leading expert in this, in this field. Yeah, that might that might work. Um, I was definitely feeling the pressure with having Sean in here of having to try and explain it when he's when he's the expert. But um, yeah, we can we can chat through this. So as we mentioned before, we have some kind of cool and innovative emerging financial models that we're working on. And um, yeah, a lot of this this work comes from the fact that we are a social enterprise and we are nonprofit. Therefore, we can't take on shareholder capital in the typical way of a for-profit seeking uh, organization. So we kind of have to find some different workarounds to begin to get, I guess, the levels of capital, capital necessary to start making a larger impact uh, that we want to make. Um, so one of the first and kind of simplest ways is uh, what's known as social procurement. So that's essentially uh, when governments or, or contracts have a stipulation uh, within them that states that a certain percentage of that contract or certain activities within that contract uh, must be allocated to a social purpose organization. Um, so that's somewhat similar to, to what we do when we install um, solar and we have people being trained to do the installation. Uh, you could have a contract for a solar installation that would have those sort of stipulations in it, or you could have, um, yeah, it really could look many different ways, uh, but it's beginning to to integrate social enterprises into, into government contracts. And then along those lines is uh, a bit more of a, I guess a mindset shift, which is known as outcomes purchasing. And outcomes purchasing really begins to put value on solutions rather than paying for problems. Um, so one, one good example um, outside of solar is uh, a lot of First Nations, especially in Northern communities, have problems with diabetes, um, mainly because the food sources that they have are, are not very healthy. And the government typically loves spending money on, you know, dialysis and feeding money into the problem, but they will not fund solutions such as healthy food or beginning to grow food in a sovereign way in these nations that would not only reduce the problem and their costs in the long run, but, but would also empower, empower the local populations. So out of that kind of pioneering work from, from Sean um, in Manitoba, we kind of are working on our own outcomes purchasing model. And uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Jessica, we've been working on what we're calling a just solar project. So the just solar project uh, proposes to install solar on First Nations, nonprofits, and low-income housing um, in the Edmonton area. And um, kind of the outcomes that we want government to purchase from us for the solutions that we're providing um, are lower energy bills, reduced social assistance costs, uh, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and um, a few others that uh, aren't listed here. But essentially, from a project that's worth uh, an investment of about $17 million, we believe we could deliver uh, well over $47 million in total benefits. Um, and that's fairly conservative. And so, yeah, you have all these different outcomes coming, um, but it, it really takes a shift in mindset from 
paying for problems to valuing solutions. And this, um, this is what Sean has really been putting language towards um, in, the, in the last few years. And a lot, of, a lot of his work and our work is essentially educating um, government and government agents as to how, I guess, to decolonialize the funding model that is currently being used, uh, not only in Canada, but around the world and begin to value solutions um, instead of just throwing money at problems. And it's, it's really, a, it's a sh radical shift in mindset, um, but I think the change also delivers radical and impressive results. So this is, this is probably kind of the most cutting edge uh, part of our, of our work. And, uh... The, these innovative next generation uh, financial tools, I think also are accompanied with an inner cultural change. Uh, and so in trying to find a way of naming the, this project and sort of the wider scope, uh, the Cree term uh, for abundance or wealth, Wiyotan, uh, is, is where we've come to. And uh, I was speaking with Elder Roy about this a, a couple of months ago. And he says, said, uh, we attend is like someone gives you a whole bunch of apples. And the energy of that is we the the sense of abundance. And, and of course, as many of you know, giveaways are a foundation for Plains Cree and you have the potlatch on the West Coast. And and the sense of, of generosity is, has governed communities in the Canadian territories for generations uh, pre-Canada. And, you know, in many of these nations, uh, generosity was considered the, uh, the primary sign for wealth. And I do believe that, you know, just like the sun uh, mimics this generosity in so many ways, uh, our financial tools uh, essentially, we found out of thin air to combat COVID, COVID in Canada, one and a half trillion dollars. And surely we can find the same generosity to fight poverty in the many communities across Canada and around the world, and certainly uh, have the resources to address climate change as well. So I, I feel like the primary source of energy really at the end of the day is this internal energy of generosity and goodwill towards all of our kin in the human and non-human worlds. And that really is the fulcrum of change. And that's uh, really at the heart of our, uh, our wish for this practical embodiment of these timeless, timeless teachings. So the Wiyotin project essentially is a fund to pay it forward. Uh, we finance clean energy projects uh, across Canada and use the savings to pay it forward uh, and finance more. And uh, with that kind of generosity, I, I think the world's 95 are all of the world's external problems. Uh, uh, um, barring the fragility of this human life uh, at its depth, we can solve uh, all of these things. So uh, in that spirit, uh, the next, looking at these various elements and the holistic approach to uh, our work. Um, we've connected most recently with the Muskogee's Education Schools Commission, uh, who already have a nationally leading and groundbreaking program, uh, basically providing food uh, to their students. So uh, in the next slide, it outlines this, yeah, there's close to 2,400 students and staff that are fed two healthy meals a day made from scratch on site. Uh, in the high schools where the students are old enough, it's integrated into their curriculum. So the students are preparing the meals themselves. And essentially, uh, they've created this huge infrastructure. You can see the trucks in the middle um, to feed a village of 2,500 people every day. You can see Scott Hall on the very left, on the left picture, and then a, a student uh, facing us. Um, and the next stage, they've asked, invited us to partner with them to vision now growing the food. So we're looking at best practices and curriculum, the history of indigenous agriculture, 
pre-contact uh, and post-contact uh, using the Indigenous vision to found uh, a new way of, of growing foods and integrating it into our education as the holistic education, of course, would do. And um, seeing how we can then not only benefit the school, but also uh, benefit as they already are uh, the wider Musk, uh, Muskegee's community. So uh, that'll, that's just beginning to start now and it'll ramp up in 2021. And I guess as a, as a summary uh, concluding slide for our presentation this evening is this uh, poem uh, by Hafiz where he, um, he says, and still after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. And with that, uh, we thank you uh, without supporters uh, like yourselves who are joining us today and, and the many, many, you know, who uh, couldn't be with us this evening. Uh, we're very grateful for your support and encouragement and, and without these relationships, we would, we would not be here. So uh, yes, with that, thanks and gratitude. I, I opened it up to folks for their comments and questions and a bit of chatting. But I was uh, interested in how far uh, around the world are you, are you, do, you do you guys uh, reach? Uh, well, when Roy uh, gifted us the name Newo, he said, uh, also include global in your name because these teachings are for the world. So we've always had global ambitions of empire, uh, but uh, I suppose of a different sort. Um, but really, I think we wanted to start rooted within our own selves in our in our close close communities and allow the good energy of those positive relationships to um, ripple out. And uh, we have been in discussions with uh, uh, friends and community in Nepal, but um, I think we're still establishing firmly our roots here in, in this part of Turtle Island and um, in cooperation with Sean, we're doing some cross Canada work and and most recently with the Wheaton project are partnering with an organization in the United States that also are doing a pay it forward model. So we're, we're not quite there yet, but certainly uh, we feel like this energy is for everyone. And, and we're, I guess this is our humble first public storytelling and we hope there are many more stories to tell in the future. Wow, that's yeah, fantastic. Heard, it's Sean from uh, from Winnipeg. Um, I meet with these guys on a weekly basis, so I kind of thought I was up on things, but wow, it's a lot more going on than I than I even imagined. What an inspiring evening. Um, I just wanted to say the word that keeps coming to my mind is trajectory. And Naval uh, is not going to be in this same place uh, 12 months from now. And you can see these very provocative uh, economic steps that are about to be taken in so many different ways. It's going to be so exciting to see how it unfolds. Um, and apparently, la, la, you know, the experts who are saying that the next 10 years will be more change in human society than there has been uh, for, for thousands of years, may, maybe forever. It's just a phenomenal renewable energy prices coming down. So renewable energy is on a trajectory as our fossil fuels, social enterprises going up super, super quickly. And uh, a lot of what we see the social enterprise economy is just to pick up on what Seb had said, um, it is an economy that is defined by indigenous elders, where at one point in time, prior to contact, so solutions mattered. They were valued. And uh, I think NAWO is, is setting some interesting patterns as to how the that uh, solid economic principle can be embedded in our current society uh, where you can sell things like reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you can sell things like a re reduction in incarceration, a reduction in 
diabetes, and it, it, it's uh, that that work is really you know, being led by NAWO and others across the country. So it's really nice to be with such an inspiring group tonight. Thanks so much, Sean. You've been such a big reporter, uh, supporter of us, uh, Sean. You you think you're on the cutting edge, and then you trundle along and then you pop your head up and then you see like there's this entire established ecosystem so like I thought we were all that until like Sean I met Sean and he gave a talk and it was the first time I heard the term social enterprise I thought wow this is very cool that's who we are and we're still very unique but then you pop your head up a bit more there's like a, a center for social enterprise at Grant McEwen there's a center for social enterprise at Mount Royal like so it's very interesting how these terms and conditions uh that we hadn't heard of, you know, two years ago are now like embedded in our culture and, and it's just exciting to be a part of it and see how many people are rising with us in support of the kind of work we're doing and have shared many of the same vision and values. It's Marv uh, from Camrose. Uh, I'm wondering if anybody uh, knows uh, whether the city council here in Camrose or any community council has uh, established a requirement that new homes be uh, energy self-sufficient. Um, anybody aware of that? Know anything about that? It seems like a, a no-brainer to me and I don't know why one community somewhere hasn't set that as a requirement for new homes and then maybe a 10-year plan of converting old homes i don't know anybody it, ever heard of that it's certainly coming uh, gage maybe you can speak to some of that yeah so there are i think that vancouver is the leader for being as close to that as possible they're not completely at net zero for new buildings but they are they do improve on the building code right now. And I'm I'm hoping that the next time the building code gets updated for Canada or for Alberta, that it'll include at least closer to net zero, if not net zero for new builds, because it's something that really needs to happen. And uh, also one thing to throw in there is and this was last year, so maybe even two years ago, we, we worked with uh, a a net zero home builder in Edmonton who is currently building homes at the same price, if not lower um, than a conventional home. So it makes, it's really getting to the point where it makes no sense to build a conventional home. You're essentially uh, kind of just throwing money away right off the bat. So that, that world is coming. It is a no brainer, Marv, you're right. Um, it's, we absolutely should be doing it, but there's lots of no brainers uh, that we don't do. Um, so. And one more note about that is Edmonton has somewhat of that starting in one of the smaller communities. Uh, it's called Blatchford and it's like right north of where Nate is and all of the buildings there are going to be net zero and we'll have solar and we'll be uh, using heat from uh, geo exchange and sewage heat recovery system instead of uh, from natural gas. And I, I really hope that there are like more and more communities like that to pop up. Yeah, the only disadvantage of that one is we had to give up the uh, city center airport. Yeah, that is true. That's yeah. a joke. <laughs> I'm a pilot. I used to fly in there and park there all the time. And uh, speaking of municipalities, Sean's doing some very, very leading edge work in uh, Saskatchewan and Ontario, essentially partnering using some of these social uh, economic tools to really basically put an end to homelessness. Um, and essentially when you, you work out the budgets at, at the first provider contacts between police services, emergency services and ambulance, um, it really is much cheaper to house and support our vulnerable homeless population than to basically treat them through uh, expensive emergency services, uh, you know, police or otherwise. So 
um, stay tuned. Um, basically, I think the world we're, we're looking towards is one where economic modeling uh, is cognizant of the effects of our activities and engages in, in decision making, understanding these kinship ties. And, and at the moment, you know, the present economy uh, gets uh, one way of gaining wealth is by externalizing our costs. And um, that doesn't make sense for a community. Uh, so we're basically just bringing back those costs because we're all connected. There is no such thing as an externalization of costs. I, I was wondering if there's anything that the community can do to ask, um, well, for various changes, but um, like I'm thinking of, of Sean, of course, uh, and I know the phenomenal work. Uh, I'm also thinking of who, who do, instead of hoping the building standards will change, is there anyone we can speak to like, should we speak to local build business or builders in cameras? Should we speak to the city council? Uh, how could we help? All of the above. City council would be important to talk to for that because municipalities can improve upon the building code. Uh, they can't go under the building code, but they can improve upon it, which is what Vancouver has done right now. So that'd be one way. While you're there, Margaret, um, talk to them about a social procurement policy. Um, most major cities in Canada now have one. So Seb was talking about that, meaning that if you can supply something like drywalling or installing a sidewalk, and do it while em employing people who are formerly incarcerated so they're not incarcerated on a regular basis, you can actually get paid for the second benefit. And, uh, and this is one of the exciting things that's happening is that governments are starting to figure out they can save a lot of money by buying goods and services from social enterprises. So uh, if you're going, you may as well just kind of throw that on the pile. And, and, I, and I'd be happy to go with you on both counts. And I think that's one of the reasons we're telling the story uh, is that um, so often in public discourse and, and, and media, it seems like there's, there's these conflicting interests at play. And I think when we really understand the fabric of the community, you know, the benefit to one is the benefit to all. And uh, yeah, the, the solutions of uh, the next economy are, are a win-win for everybody, a win for the environment, a win for the vulnerable, and a win economically and a win for the health of the community. And that's really what we should be striving for in, in all our activities. And uh, it feels, yeah, it feels very wonderful to be a part of. Um, and I have to say that the primary fuel is the good people, the good hearts of the good people who are, uh, you know, recognize what we're doing and and uh, support it in various ways. And I, I, ca I can say that it's those good people and the good hearts that really have made us a success, both from the people who work for us and, and the people who've hired us and, and the many layers of community beyond. So we, yeah, I, I really have to extend my gratitude to everyone here and, and uh, and uh, for for and the many community folks beyond that have made us who we are, and I guess that was my sort of experiment coming from my religion and philosophy background, um, that we do need the world to rise up with us because of our connectivity, like we cannot be successful alone, and it's kind of like either the world will be ready for this and will succeed or not. And we'll, we'll you know, we'll be compost for, for somebody else. And I just am um, every, every day, every month, you know, starting up a, a business is not easy. And believe me, uh, most months you're not sure about payroll and you're not sure about contracts and, 
and you're not sure. And I guess, you know, this is the experience of many businesses today and, and we need each other to make a success of it. And we're learning more and more, you know, uh, we do the humble things and wearing our masks and that's not to protect ourselves, but to protect others. And that, that goes for all of our activities. And, and uh, yeah, so our success is really the success of others and, and the support of others. And we're, we always remain very, very much grateful and, and honored uh, to, be, to, to be working in partnerships with all these people.